DIY activities, live stream DJ sets, and recipes uh, with botanical inspired cocktails. We'd like to give a big thanks to our presenting sponsors, LADWP and XPRIZE. Um, a little housekeeping before we get started. Tonight's program will be interpreted in Spanish. And if you're interested in using this feature, you can visit our website, nhm.org slash summer nights, um, where you can navigate full instructions of how to get that set up. And to enable it on Zoom, what you'll need to do is um, find the interpretation button on the bottom right of your screen, click that button and choose your language. And if you'd prefer for the original audio to be muted, just hit that interpretation button again and select mute original audio. We're also gonna put those instructions in the chat box for you as well. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for the evening, Stephen Mendoza. Stephen is a gallery interpreter at the Natural History Museum who got graduated from UC Santa Barbara where he worked at the Amezo American Research Center alongside archeologists and horticulturalists studying traditional sustainable methods to preserve the ecological and cultural integrity of the ancient Maya forest garden. Take it away, Stephen. Thank you, Laurel, so much for that warm welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Summer Nights at Home series. My name is Stephen Mendoza. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm a gallery interpreter at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Tonight, I will be your moderator as we engage in fruitful discussion with the team that keeps the museum's nature gardens lush and thriving all year round. Thanks for joining us. Before we begin, I just want to let you know that tonight's program will be interpreted in Spanish, as Laurel said. If you're interested in this feature, please visit our website, nhm.org slash summer nights, where you can navigate to a full set of instructions on how to get the interpreted version of this program. If you're already registered, we will be adding those instructions to the chat box for your convenience. Si desea escuchar este programa en español, visite nuestra página web, nhm.org slash summer nights, donde puede encontrar instrucciones sobre cómo obtener la versión interpretada de este programa. Si ya está registrado, agregaremos esas instrucciones en el chat. As we are all staying safe in our homes, many Americans have decided to turn to the therapeutic and grounding properties of home gardening, especially here in Southern California, where we have beautiful gardening weather 365 days a year. Whether you're an experienced gardener or you just bought your first packet of seeds yesterday, tonight has something to offer you, because tonight we are going straight to the experts with our questions. Joining me here is the Natural, uh, Natural History Museum's very own horticulture team. These are the people that keep our 3.5 acres of nature gardens pristine and thriving all year round. And tonight they're here to answer your questions and give you tips about home gardening with fruits and vegetables. We'll spend the first half hour really figuring out what it takes to have your own vegetable garden. And we're gonna conclude with some audience Q and A. So be sure to be saving up those questions. But without further ado, I am very excited to introduce our panelists. First off, let's give a warm welcome to Daniel Feldman, pronouns he, him, his. Daniel was the very first gardener hired by the Natural History Museum in 2012. Uh, he now oversees a team of gardeners as the horticulture manager here at the Natural History Museum. Welcome, Daniel. Thanks, Stephen. Next up, we have Liz Evans, pronouns she, her, hers. Liz has spent years studying agricultural history and environmental land conflicts, getting her master's degree at the University of Pittsburgh. She's decided to trade the textbook for the trowel and is now a part of the NHM horticulture family. Hi, Liz. Hi, thanks, Stephen. Yeah. And finally, we have Alicia Peterson, pronouns she, her, hers. Alicia studied horticulture at Pierce College and California Native Plants at the Theodore Payne Foundation. Now, she has a daily opportunity to grow food for both people and wildlife here at the Natural History Museum. Welcome, Alicia. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, so I'm very excited to begin harvesting the garden knowledge you all have cultivated after years of working at the Natural History Museum's nature gardens. That's right, I have some garden puns tonight. But uh, let's kick things off by talking about those nature gardens. This is a question for Daniel. What are the nature gardens and what does the horticulture team do there? So, hi, first of all, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I hope you have all had the opportunity to visit the nature gardens before, but if you have not, or maybe you're from out of the area, um, we're a three and a half acre uh, nature garden that was built um, on the campus of the Natural History Museum. We opened in 2013, um, so fairly young. Uh, and the idea was to be a place where our visitors could um, experience what we call urban nature 
the nature that's, you know, living and thriving in our backyards and all around us. Um, we include a lot of plants that originate in California, as well as plants from uh, other similar uh, climate areas, um, drought tolerant being mainly the thing. But we also, uh, as is tonight's topic, include a rather large edible garden for um, our use. Uh, so while most of the garden is uh, geared towards wildlife and attracting other nature, the edible garden is a little more for human use. And that'll be our focus tonight. And as I said, we, we hope you all can visit soon. We hope to be um, open when we're able. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, love that edible garden. Always something yummy growing there. Um, I have a question for Liz. So hypothetically speaking, let's say we have, I don't know, a 24 year old museum educator named Steven who has never before had a garden in his life. What does one need to actually begin a successful vegetable garden? And can he do it on a budget? Cool, thanks for your question, Steven. Um, so to get started with a vegetable garden, you need a site. You need a spot where your vegetables are going to live, whether that's a backyard or a patio or inside some spot, preferably as sunny as you can find it. Um, you'll need some plants or some seeds, depending on what you're growing, what you choose. Uh, you'll need either pots or the ground or a raised bed. Um, you need soil, a shovel, hand pruners, and maybe gloves. And that's pretty much it. You need a hose or a watering can. So to get started, it's really simple. It's easy. It's achievable. And the really nice part about gardening is that the more you do it, the cheaper the hobby becomes. You start to save your own seeds. You start to take your own cuttings of plants. You start to build your own compost, make your own soil, make your own mulch. And so the more you do it, the more you start to create it yourself. And it gets... Um, you know, really rewarding and is very accessible for people. That's good to hear. <laughs> yeah. yeah, amazing. So um, this question's for Alicia. So I hear a lot of words tossed around uh, about organic gardening and conventional gardening. What's the difference between these two methods? And do you have a preference? Yeah, Stephen, that's an important question. Um, and I think a lot of people assume that the difference is just whether or not you use pesticides, but it's a little deeper than that. Um, I like to think of conventional gardening as gardening kind of this isolating method of gardening. So you are isolating a problem within the garden and then choosing a chemical to treat that problem. So say you have a pepper plant and you have a little insect that's munching on that pepper plant and a conventional gardener will look for a chemical pesticide to kill that insect versus organic gardening, which is a more holistic view of the garden. So you're looking at the garden as a whole and you're making choices that help the health of that whole system. So say we have that pepper plant and an insect is munching on it, rather than reach for that pesticide, we may look for maybe what's stressing out that pepper plant. Um, maybe it's not getting enough water, maybe it's getting overcrowded by a big tomato plant. Um, and we'll try to address those needs, or we'll wait for another insect to maybe take care of that munching critter. We'll wait for a ladybug or a lacewing. So you're looking to that whole system and benefiting the health of all of it. So at the Natural History Museum, we only garden organically, um, and we really rely on this diverse um, and really lively group of insects and birds and soil dwelling critters to keep our plants healthy. Wow, I didn't realize that the health of a plant could actually affect whether or not pests attack it. That's interesting. Plants yeah. are amazing. They are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, I have a question here for Daniel. What does it mean to garden sustainably? So this will build a little bit off of what Alicia just mentioned about um, organic gardening. Um, a big bulk of sustainable gardening is uh, supporting that, that whole system, uh, ecosystem approach, you know, of having uh, healthy soil, for one thing, um, starting from kind of the ground up. So our soil is the foundation of that. Um, if we have healthy soil, we're not going to need to place a lot of uh, extra amendments. Um, and we won't have to bring a lot of extra things in. Um, and 
going from that, you know, we need to start reusing what we can, um, making compost out of uh, extra plant material and green waste, which will further feed the soil and uh, continue what we call feeding the soil food web. Uh, that's a term that we use a lot, which is referring to um, all the millions of little microorganisms that actually live in our soil and interact with uh, plants. Um, so sustainable gardening is this uh, approach of you know, almost having nothing leave the grounds if possible, or as little leave the grounds as you can manage and reusing that, reincorporating it. Um, a good example is, you know, a uh, old growth forest or something, a very old forest where all the leaves that have ever fallen there are accumulating on the ground, uh, deteriorating and uh, leading to this very beneficial uh, growing environment. We take a lot of things out of our garden as in fruits and vegetables. So we need to be putting compost back uh, to replace, you know, that layer. Wow. Anyone That's want exciting. to add? Well, that's exciting. I just started composting myself and um, it's a really rewarding experience, you know, like all my extra scraps, I just put it back in the ground. It's exciting. I, every time I do it, every time I get that nasty whiff, I, I just get a smile on my face. <laughs> it's exciting, you know? <laughs> um, alrighty. So I have a question for Liz next. Um, a lot of us live here in the city where space is pretty tight. Some of us don't really have yards to grow in. What are some affordable ways we can garden in tight spaces or without a yard. Cool. Yeah, I'm a, I grew up in a big city too. And so, you know, I can definitely relate to not having a lot of space. And so when you're tight on space, one of the best things you can do is grow in a container. Um, you can use uh, terracotta pots. You can use the plastic pots you, that your nursery plants come in. Um, you can build yourself a raised bed if you have the space for that. Um, you can always build up. So even if all you've got is like a patio, but it's outside, you can put in bricks, you can add soil, and you can sort of build your soil up and you can grow in there really successfully. Um, the thing with container gardening is you can choose to do it organically or you can choose to do it the conventional way. Both of them work. So uh, whatever you're comfortable with, we tend to really prefer the organic way to do it. Um, that's the way I understand it the most. Um, but you can absolutely do organic style of gardening in containers. Um, you want to make sure that all your containers have holes in the bottom. That's really important so that they get good drainage. You want to make sure your soil drains well. And typically when you're growing in a container, you've got to water it more than you would if it was in the ground. So you've got to, that's one sort of tip or trick, you, you want to make sure that you're hitting it a little more with water than you otherwise would. If you've got um, no outside space at all, so that you're only growing like inside an apartment, you don't have a balcony, you can still definitely grow uh, your own veggies. Uh, but your choices are a little more limited. So you want to get a spot that's as sunny as you can manage it in your apartment. And you can grow things like herbs. So cilantro, thyme, oregano, basil, mint will all do pretty well. And another thing you can do is basically grow your own little microgreen forest. So you can have sprouts starting, sprouts of beans, sprouts of peas, lettuce, stuff like that. And if it's just like a little guy, then you can harvest it and add it to like a nice salad or a sandwich or something like that. And it's really tasty. So you can still be pulling plants from your indoors all the time and adding it to, to your garden. And then the one thing I'll say that, because um, your question is about how to do it affordably, and I think all of those are pretty affordable, but there's a real trap with growing in containers and growing in indoors where it gets expensive, where you buy a lot of pots, or you might buy a system to help you grow, like a vertical wall. Um, sometimes those work. But I had an experience where uh, a nursery, a plant nursery I was working at was selling a hydro tower. Um, and it was really expensive. You needed to add filtered water to the base of it. You needed to add their own chemical additives to feed it. It was really, it struggled. It was really tough. So, you know, don't blow money on a big vertical system. You can absolutely achieve it with little pots here and there stuck in your sunny spots and, you know, trellising your tomatoes up is a nice way to get a vertical garden 
know, having a nice spine and then having it grow like up something is a way to fill a really tight corner. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a question for all of you. Uh, we've talked about the pots and we've talked about the soil. Let's talk about some plants. So what do you think is a good first plant to grow? Like we're talking level one here. <laughs> What's a good beginner plant? Um, Liz already mentioned my idea, but I, I would say pick your favorite herb, one that you actually use a lot and um, try that in a pot next to your kitchen window. If you have a sunny kitchen window or in a good spot in your garden or pick a few and put them all in a pot together. Um, you can use them right away and it's something that'll just keep growing. And they're generally a little more forgiving than some things. Liz, do you have a- oh, Yeah, so I would say, plant? yeah, I would say cilantro. Whether you're like growing it from seed, you can pretty much grow it anywhere and it'll get a little bit of water and it'll still grow. And if it's too sunny and it gets too leggy, you can still eat the, uh, the flowers you can still eat the seeds. The seeds are actually coriander. You can save them and throw them out again next year. So I really like that one. Oh, I didn't realize that. Alicia, do you have a favorite beginner plant? Yeah, I'm staying on this herb trend. Uh, I think my favorite would be a variety of basil that's becoming a lot easier to find. It's been popularized. It's called African blue basil. Mm -hmm. We grow it in the edible garden. Um, and it's this miraculous basil that produces food all summer long. Uh, it's I actually have January some right here. Showing some. <laughs> it creates these beautiful flowers. The pollinators love the flowers. And because it's a perennial basil, unlike most of the basils you grow in your garden, which you want to cut the flowers off to keep leaf production, this one's perennial. Um, so you can leave the flowers going. You can eat the flowers, but it attracts so many buzzing, wonderful insects. So you get this tasty basil, beautiful plant, and all those happy pollinators. So African blue basil is my favorite. African <laughs> blue basil. Yeah, um, I say it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Can you define perennial for those of us who may not know what it is? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So a perennial plant is one that will grow year after year. So think of all of our fruit trees would be a perennial um, a lot of our vegetable plants are annuals. So they'll put all their growth into one season. They'll produce your tomato or your squash, and then they'll peter out. Um, and they, you know, they put all of their energy into that one year's growth and that's it. So that's the difference. Okay. Thank you. Amazing. That, that's a beautiful basil plant. I'm glad that you had it right there. <laughs> How convenient. I, I took some cuttings home and it makes a decent cut flower too. And it kind of leaves a nice scent in your room. Nice. Alrighty, so let's say I went to my local nursery. I just bought my African blue basil and I'm really excited about growing it. I have a yard. Uh, can I just dig a hole in my backyard and plop it in there or do I need some kind of specific soil? How does that work? Well, with African blue basil, you actually can just stick it right in the ground because it is the most forgiving basil. It'll take any kind of soil, but most plants that's not really the case. Um, you're, normally you're gonna only grow as healthy a plant as your soil is healthy. So um, basically what you feed the soil, the soil feeds you back in return. Um, Daniel mentioned the soil food web earlier, which is a really important concept. Um, it's this amazing interaction between bacteria and fungi and earthworms that are all decomposing organic matter and releasing those nutrients to make them accessible to the plants and also improving the soil structure. Um, and the best way to feed that soil food web is to add compost. Um, so you add compost or you add organic mulches like straw or wood chips um, or even food scraps. If you don't have you know, squirrels and raccoons visiting you, you can dig a little hole in your backyard and just compost directly in place. Um, compost is one of the most rewarding, beneficial, and cheap things you can do for your garden. I think we're all, you know, creating a lot of food scraps every time we make a meal. Um, so putting that in like your compost bin and then adding to your soil. Soils are resilient. If you take care of them, they'll bounce back and, and take care of you. Amazing. And it cuts on our emissions, right? Composting's great. I'm really excited yeah. about composting. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So do you know of any resources that can help some young gardeners that are just getting started? Um, we were going to suggest a few resources for obtaining supplies, maybe like the um, city sanitation does supply some green waste compost to people for free. Is that LA city sanitation? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's a number of locations that you can look up online. Um, LA Compost is an organization that we've worked with, a nonprofit organization in Los Angeles that has a number of uh, compost pickup points where you can bring your green waste. And um, they will compost it at a variety of different sites. Um, and they're a good uh, educational resource too for those of you that want to learn about composting. Um, LACompost.org is their website. Um, cool. Also, I recommend everyone get a good book or two. Mm -hmm. I really like Sunset's Western Garden Guide as a general, like, how do I figure out what I can grow in California type of book. It's really big. There's so many editions. Any of the editions are fine. It's probably at your local library, but you could also probably find a used copy without too much trouble. And it covers edibles as well as ornamentals, but it's just got a lot of like it'll tell you like really what zone you're in are you too hot for this or too too much coastal influence for that and you can really kind of pinpoint your zone and then figure out which plants are going to be most successful for you and then also diagnose some common plant problems so that's the the western garden book by sunset and i think one more i'll add is just your own um, senses, I suppose. Like trust your own senses when you're out in the garden. Plants are trying to communicate with us as woo woo as that sounds. Um, plants mm -hmm. are giving us signals if they need water or attention or if they're getting chewed on, you know, they're talking to us. So if you just, you know, use your eyes and your ears and um, develop kind of that relationship with your plants, that would be a, a good starting point. Thank you for all that input. Um, I have a question here. What would you say is the hardest part of gardening? What's the most challenging part? Do you want to start, Daniel? I suppose so. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, gardening can be a very rewarding thing. I think um, some of the biggest challenges can be patience, um, waiting for something to grow. We feel this urge that we need to like take care of it or constantly nurture it. Um, sometimes it's best to just step back from a plant and um, give it a chance to grow first. You can kill things with kindness. Um, we've all experienced that in the garden, I think. Um, another thing that I was going to mention is um, this attachment to plants that I think a lot of people feel. Um, we get overly emotional and attached to them sometimes and uh, don't want to get rid of something don't want to change it out uh, when it's clearly lived its uh, life already. So um, be, being ready to swap a couple plants out here and there when they're not doing successfully, um, I think would prepare someone well. I think one of the hardest parts about gardening for any, any like beginner gardener who's just getting started is that you have to get over the gross factor. You have to get over the ickiness. Um, as organic gardeners, we usually will squish something before we reach for the spray bottle. Like if I see white fly, I'm just gonna use my finger and take it off and then I go wash my hands, but I have to accept that I just squished this bug. Um, you can get spiders in your hair, you can get scratches from citrus trees, you can, get, you can get really messy and really dirty and you just have to get through that and then decide that you're comfortable with it and it doesn't bother you. It's sort of like learning how to breathe through a snorkel mask. So it's like, yes, it's uncomfortable, but then you, you accept it and you figure out how to do it. And then you don't really notice it anymore and you enjoy yourself. I guess, and I'd say uh, the biggest challenge for me and I think for a lot of new gardeners is figuring out watering. Uh, watering, especially in our climate is a big challenge and with climate change and with extended droughts, you know, it's really important that we are watering um, conscientiously and we obviously don't want to use any more water than we need. So figuring out that kind of delicate balance of giving the plants what they need and not flooding them. And a lot of that has to do with consistency. And again, uh, 
listening to your plants and reading those cues um, really helps. But yeah, figuring out that, that watering part. And the Thank best you. tool for that is putting your finger in the soil and feeling how moist it is at that point. Um, yeah, a lot of people ask, you know, how, how do I tell when my plant needs water? That, that's, that's the best way to tell. Right. Yeah, and then if you are working with containers, you can just lift them. And if they are light, <laughs> absolutely go ahead and water them. And if, you know, if they're kind of heavy and have, the heavier they usually are, then you're fine and you don't need to baby it or overwater it. I think for a lot of beginning gardeners, they like Daniel and Alicia were both saying, they really, really, really want their plants to work and they really want it to be successful. And then maybe they water it every single day and then wonder why it turned yellow and fell over. Because um, <laughs> it drowned. But uh, yeah, you know, pay attention to your plants. Your leaves can be red. They'll tell you if they're nutrient deficient. And over time, you can learn, you know, what type of pattern on a leaf is telling you what kind of thing. And you can learn to diagnose these problems yourself and cut them off. As professional gardeners, do you all ever kill plants? All the time. Yes. All the we're, time. we're all guilty of that. You're not a gardener until you've killed more plants than you've kept alive. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Most of what we do during the day is take out the plants you don't want. Right. We kill them all the time. And the plants you do want sometimes die anyway. Mm -hmm. But don't give up. Right. Continue. Keep going. <laughs> That's great to hear. <laughs> okay. So practice patience, uh, practice conscious watering, and embrace the grossness. These are all great tips. Yes. Um, last question we have written here. What do you love about gardening? Um, I love watching a garden grow and growing with it in some ways. Um, I love that when I'm in the garden, I'm focusing my attention outward. Everything is about what I'm looking at and what's around me. Um, and I, so it's a time to really connect with the natural world as I'm working. Like I'm outside, I'm surrounded by plants and butterflies and birds, and I'm, you know, scanning the landscape and moving slowly. And it's just really, um, refreshing and calming to have that connection with nature. And that's why I do it every day. And I'm a, I agree with both of those sentiments. Um, and maybe evident from how I've been answering the last couple of questions, um, I guess my most rewarding part of gardening is developing these non-human relationships because, uh, you know, as much as I love humans, I really love plants. And I love having those relationships with the, the plants and then all the critters that also rely and depend on those plants, you know, because we're all, we're all connected. It's amazing. Well, thank you for answering all my questions. Um, we do have some questions from our viewers here, which is really exciting. The first question is from Catherine Caporal. Oops, I just lost it. Where did it go? Oh, okay. Here we are. It says, new gardener here. In these very hot days, I worry about my little garden. It's all in pots. Should I water in the morning and night? Both? Could I overwater? Ha I have tomato, basil, uh, baby pepper, leeks, green onion, and butter lettuce. There's lots of question marks in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that sounds like an amazing garden you've got started. Uh, and I. I mean, kind of piggybacking on what Liz said earlier and Daniel, like the best way to, to check your soil moisture is to use your finger. And if, um, you know, it's, it's can be dry at the very tip of your finger, but if it's um, not, if it's, you can't feel the moisture by that first knuckle, then you really want to water. And the thing with plants and vegetables in plants is you really, it, it's hard to overwater in the summer, unless you're growing it in a, like a, a bathtub, you know, like most of our pots, um, really can use a lot of water. Um, you probably won't need to water more than once a day unless you're you know, out in baking sun. Um, but I would, yeah, I'd check that soil moisture with your finger, look at the plant, the plants are behaving and then water accordingly. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, I'd also say that um, if you can choose between morning and night, morning is better. Early morning is better. Sometimes when you water at night, uh, things can sit and it cools down at night, even if it is super hot. And that can sometimes uh, introduce certain soil pathogens. So usually early morning watering is best. But if you don't have time, because sometimes we're all running around, then evening's good. You really don't want to do it like middle of the day when it is hot. That's not the best. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question here from Pam Martin. It says, my planting area is outside with terrible sandy clay soil and a hot, hot sun. Without having to make a raised bed, what can I grow? Clay is difficult for uh, a lot of our vegetables. Um, you could try some root veggies to try and start penetrating some of that hard soil. Um, you could try starting to compost and amend, right. adding mulch to your clay soils. Um, I think over time, you're really going to want to build it into something better. Um, so before you're growing a lot of uh, vegetables, I mean, there's probably some fruits that you could try in clay soil. Anyone have any, any ideas? I, I think... Um... I have a lot of clay soil where I'm at and the artichoke does really well. Hmm. Artichokes will grow in like almost the worst conditions you can imagine and with a lot of neglect. And the real big challenge with them is that the leaves get aphids and you just want to make sure the head of the artichoke doesn't get aphids. Um, if the leaves get it, it's not the end of the world. Um, it's, you just kind of want to keep them from getting up the stem, but they do pretty good in clay. Um, if you amend your soils, you can do citrus and clay, like that's okay. We have a lot of calcium in our soils in California too, and so that's really good. Um, the heat, the hot, hot heat is really good for things like peppers and tomato. The clay is the challenging part. Uh, so like Daniel was saying, if you can, you don't have to go full raised bed, but even if you can go up like four inches and then just kind of berm it, you can get a little more tilt, a little more depth, and uh, improve your soils a little bit. You could also try African blue basil. <laughs> oh. Sorry if that was loud. <laughs> We're plugging that plant tonight. Yeah, we are. Not sponsored. Yeah, yeah. I'm definitely going to go buy one. Definitely. So I have a question here from Tania Perez. Is it too late to start a vegetable garden in July? Not no. here. We are, like you mentioned earlier, we're so lucky to have 365 days to grow things here. Um, your only limiting factor is your day length. So our days are getting shorter now and some things won't respond as well. But honestly, most things will respond just fine. Your only trick is gonna be to make sure to stay on top of that watering because your new baby plants that you're putting in now are gonna have a really tiny root system and that um, shallow depth is going to dry out a lot faster than plants that have already put their roots into the ground in the cooler spring months. So you just want to really monitor um, the soil moisture. Um, but yeah, by all means, go ahead and put things in the ground. Mm -hmm. And the kind of things you might plant in the winter in the sunlight, like beets or carrots, you can put in the shade in the summer. Does that make sense? So like in the, in when it's cooler and we're trying to maximize the sun and the heat this time of year, if you're worried, like my area gets blasted with sunlight, you can try and find a shadier spot and stick some things in there and they'll be pretty successful. Awesome. Uh, I have another question here from Ann Brunner it says going back to composting, I bought a metal trash can and started putting everything from banana peels to eggshells into it. What do I do now? <laughs> it's a Good big start. One. Um, <laughs> yeah. So there's a number of different ways of composting. Um, you can use a worm bin uh, and have worms start breaking that down for you. Uh, or you can start layering it with uh, what we call brown material, which is like your dry leaves, twigs, woody stuff, and layering the uh, green material, which would be what, what, what you're collecting in your trash can, um, basically. 
Um, you don't just want to put all that stuff into a trash can with the lid on forever because that's not going to be a pretty thing to deal with after a little while. Um, basically, you want to be alternating those browns and greens and uh, making sure there's some oxygen and some moisture in there also. And that's when compost will start occurring. Yeah, when, we, when we build compost at the museum, uh, we flip it all the time. So we have it in like this cylinder and then we open up the cylinder and we like air it out with pitchforks and move it and flip it and water it as we go and then let it rest again until it reaches a temperature and then do that process again. Um, if you don't do that, or like Daniel said, you don't let like worms and other critters break it down for you, it'll just rot. Um, so you're gonna wanna be able to mix your greens with your browns. Brown, something like your shredded junk mail. Like it doesn't have to be, sometimes browns are yes. hard to come by if you don't have twigs, you know? So shred up all that junk mail, as long as there's no plastic, you know, window screen. Um, add that old newspaper, old cardboard if you tear it up and shred it up. So you wanna aim for that kind of 50-50 ratio that Daniel's talking about. So 50% of your compost will be that green material, your food scraps, your coffee grounds, your eggshells, and then 50% is that brown material. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm so into composting right now. Be sure to give it oxygen. That's something I learned, lots of holes in it. Be sure to put holes in it and like just let it air out. <laughs> yes. Um, Okay, so we have a question here from Anonymous. Hi, I overwatered my plant, exclamation point. What should I do to bring it back to life? Well, make sure that the container it's in has some drainage holes, I think would be my first um, thing to point out, if it's in a container. If it's in the ground, then... Just stop watering? Yeah, just, yeah. just let it rest a little bit. Um, let the soil dry out, like we were saying, to the first uh, digit of your finger or the second digit of your finger. Um, and then try to be a little more moderate, less frequent, perhaps, with your watering. And if the plant didn't rot and if it's still got some life to it, it should spring back over time. Uh, patience is important in this case, too. Thank you. Um, someone asked if they could have a follow-up question. I'm just going to answer that. Yes, as many questions as you'd like, folks. You could just, you know, flood us if you'd like. Um, here's another question. My aloe once went brown. I watered it. How do we keep our aloe from getting brown? Your aloe went brown. Did it, if it, if your aloe gets really thick and mushy, you watered it too much. And if it gets really hard and crisp and dry, you're not watering it enough. Do you know what I mean? Like if it starts to get sharp and crisp at the tip. Um, but succulents are really resilient. So as long as it's not brown and mushy, like total mush, um, you can kind of let it dry out. You can repot it. Again, something with, you make sure it has drainage holes and uh, fresh soil and repot it or replant it in the ground and it should recover. Cold weather can discolor them occasionally too. Hmm. Maybe that's part of what's being referred to. All righty. We have a question here from Donald Chandler. Some things in my compost, like avocado peels or sticks, don't break into small pieces easily. Are you supposed to grind those up? You if can. You if you want to put in that extra effort, or you can just save those at the end of your composting run and add them to the next compost pile. So if you have anything that's not breaking down, like corn cobs or another thing that notoriously don't break down, I compost my jeans when I'm done with them and those take like three cycles to break down, but I just save them and add them to the next compost pile. So I'm not, you know, you can, you can absolutely extend that effort, but I think a lot of gardening is picking your battles of how much energy you want to you want it, it's exert. a good way of like inoculating that next pile too with some of the um, beneficial organisms that are already in that first pile that you build. So carrying over those woody bits and whatever doesn't break down into the next pile is definitely um, a beneficial practice. I'd say it helps that next pile get started. Yeah. Let's see, we have a question from Wilson Wing. So are some insects a possible indication of possible health or lack of plant health? Yeah, yeah, like I was saying um, earlier, um, 
a, a stressed out plant will are actually sending out signals that invite those insects to it. Um, I don't know the science behind specific insect communication with plants, but I do know that, yeah, if your plant is stressed out, then it's gonna be more likely to succumb to insect pressure than if you have a really vibrant, healthy plant. So yeah, look for maybe those, those root causes of stress in your plant. Um, generally it's watering related. It could be exposure related, it could be shaded out, it could be a nutrient deficiency. So look for those um, first. So we have another question here from Tania Perez. What bugs are not a good sign if you see them in your compost bin? And what bugs are a good sign that your compost is healthy? Uh, I'm guessing this is a passive, like a static compost pile, one that they're just adding stuff to and layering it. Um, you know, I think most insects are pretty much okay in there because they're pretty much consuming something. What you don't want are mammals. You don't want rodents in your compost bin. Um, so you want to stay away from adding any meats or cooked foods in there, certainly. Just keep to raw vegetables for the most part and things that you know are going to break down OK. Um, bad smells are a sign that something is going wrong in your compost bin. If it smells like, if it smells foul, then it's probably not aerated enough. Um, so it's more scents, uh, the moisture level is important in making compost. You want it to always be kind of a, a spongy moisture. Um, I don't know, can you guys think of bugs that would be a, a bad I sign? I mean, I, it's, I don't like it when uh, flies get in my compost bin, because you know, then you get all the fly maggots and that's not so great. Um, I don't, it's not great when there's slugs inside of it. And so I'll take those out but they're not really harming the breakdown process. The best bugs are like the roly polies and the earthworms and that kind of stuff. But the other stuff's not hurting it, it's just making it maybe unpleasant for you to actually go and get that compost and use it. Um, yeah. yeah. And maybe, you know, like, you know those June bug larvae that are like white and thick and kind of gross? Those are things that raccoons and skunks and critters love. So if your pile has that, they will break in there to get them and dig them out and make a mess. Uh, but the, again, it's not hurting the compost. It's just about keeping those other critters out. Do you have a way to keep the flies out? It's kind of a personal question. <laughs> you can cover it. You can, yeah. you know, put a tarp over it. Um, if it's in a container, put a lid on it. You know, mm -hmm. that's a good way to exclude critters. Okay like a sheet of newspaper even, or a few sheets of newspaper over the top of uh, like our worm bin. Yeah. Has excluded flies in the past. I've seen awesome. some people use carpet. Hmm. All righty. We have uh, another question from Dessa Knuckle. I've tried growing tomatoes many times, but each time the grasshoppers come and eat them. They are green, so hard to see and hard to pick off. Do you have any suggestions on how to deal with grasshoppers? Uh, if they're hard, my first suggestion would be to go out there and, and pick them up. That's what we do in the garden. But if you're having trouble seeing them, um, you, can, you can use a what they call a row cover, which is just a really light, light fabric that you drape over your plant. And this helps with any, any kind of problem you're having, um, whether it be aphids or uh, the caterpillars or grasshoppers. Um, it's a, a cloth that's designed to go over your vegetables that still lets in the light, but it excludes those critters. And you, you can just Google um, row cover fabric or, um, yeah, Dan, do you know the name of this fabric? Does it have a name? I don't know. Um, shade cloth? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's finer than that, huh? It's finer than that. Yeah, just look, ro look up row cover cloth <laughs> um, and that'll help. Awesome. So we have a question here from Natalie Bloom. Her last name's all capitalized. Nice. Um, my rose bush generally has white flowers, but recently some stems started to grow close to the base that have red flowers. Ooh. What should I do to keep the new stems from growing? That's a fun question. So we have a grafted rose, right? 
Probably. That's that's yeah, probably we, what's yeah, going on. Yeah, most roses are grafting. Right. So if you don't know what grafting is, um, basically it's it's kind of like magic. They take the roots <laughs> from one plant, um, take the top off of another, always a related species. Like, you know, they have to be in the same family, the same genus generally. And you're going to take the top and stick it on the roots of the other plant and they're going to start growing together. They're going to fuse together and become a whole new plant. So we generally take root stocks that are stronger and more resistant to diseases, uh, graft uh, a rose on top of it and get the rose that we want with stronger roots than it had originally. So you want to um, prune off any of those uh, different stems, basically all, all the way to the base as far as you can pretty much without damaging the crown of the plant or where they're coming from. Um, and basically that will help send some of that energy that those, we call them suckers. The suckers are stealing from the top of the plant. And so if you prune those off, it should give some more vigor to the desirable rows. Grafting is really fascinating. Um, most fruit trees are grafted. There's a huge variety of plants. We've even been grafting tomatoes. I have. And grafting is kind of like, if you think about cutting like an arm off of a person and sticking out to another person and it would grow. Mm -hmm. Like that's how amazing plants are, that they are just taking whole different, you know, pieces of themselves and then regenerating cells to create a new plant. That is amazing. That really is amazing. Plants are great. Um, Let's see. So I have a question actually. Can you address the myth of the green thumb? Is that a thing? Do people have green thumbs? No. No, they, they don't. don't. They don't. You don't. Do you want to take it, Alicia? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, so yeah, you be you get good at gardening by paying attention and by noticing things and by making mistakes and killing a plant and realizing how and why you killed it and then not killing it the same way the next time. Um, <laughs> maybe a different way, but not the same <laughs> way. And the people will tell themselves that they don't have a green thumb because an attempt or two didn't work out and you can feel kind of defeated and you sort of let yourself go, oh, I don't have this magic power that other people seem to have to make it happen. Um, but plants just need what they need. And if you can learn to read them and you can learn to figure that out and then you're consistent enough to give them what they need when they need it, then they'll grow free and um, pretty reliably. And, you know, there's always like insects or critters that come in and ruin your plants later, but, um, you know, it's not about anything special happening. It's really just about attention and practice and learning as you go. And humans have been living with plants and growing plants for many thousands of years. So it's not, you know, it, it, it's kind of, we um, grow up being able to do this. I think a lot of um, kind of fear and trepidation comes from this idea of having to be sold a magic product to make something grow. Um, and that's just not the case. Like back to conventional gardening, uh, that's only existed for the last few decades. And before that, we were growing plants plenty fine without any of these kind of magic elixirs. So you absolutely, you yourself have the ability to grow plants without, you know, these kind of external inputs. You just need yourself. Awesome. All righty. Um, well, folks, Let's see, we do have a question from YouTube. How do you stop cilantro from bolting? Bolting. You pinch the tips. You sort of, you pick the top off when it starts to flower, when you notice that bud forming. You keep doing that. Um, harvest it. Yeah, you harvest it. Okay. Eat it, eat it, eat it, basically. <laughs> eat it. Eat it. And it, it bolts a lot faster in the summer, especially in sunny spots. So um, try finding a little shadier of a spot during the hottest months of the year, maybe to grow it. Right. But if it bolts, the flowers are great for pollinators. They attract a ton of pollinators. They will bring all the critters in that are going to visit your tomatoes and your peppers. So it's not really the end of the world if it bolts. And you can still eat the flower. It tastes just like the leaf. And so, you know, you can throw that in a taco or on a salad. And it's still pretty good. Sounds good. 
All righty, friends, we have time for one more question. Um, this one says, the hottest debate in my household. Planting parsley in the same pot as cilantro will make them merge. One will take over the other. We are wanting to know if you could put this debate to rest. I don't know about this one. <laughs> That's fascinating. I have not heard of that happening. And we have grown both in the same bed without them merging, but that's just one anecdote. So I'm afraid we're, we might not be able to rest the debate. <laughs> they, do, they do look very similar. So may, maybe one uh, took, took over the pot and kicked the other out. <laughs> that could be. Maybe, yeah. No. Well, that's super fascinating. Plants are amazing. Composting is super fun. Um, that is all the time we have for tonight's event, though. Thank you so much to all our panelists and to all of you for being here tonight. If you'd like to keep up with our horticulturalists and see all the cool things are growing in the Natural History Museum's Nature Garden, be sure to follow them on Instagram at NHMLA underscore nature gardens, all one word. There's always something neat to see, whether it's a cool bug that they found or a really awesome plant that they're growing. Um, it's a great Instagram to follow, please do it. We hope that you'll join us again on July 24th for our second Summer Nights at Home in this three-part series. Uh, we're gonna be talking about LA Pleistocene plants of the past. That's right, folks, we're talking about Ice Age plants. That's so exciting, right? What was that giant ground sloth eating? We'll find out next time. Uh, be sure to stick around for more Summer Nights at Home programming. From 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock tonight, DJ Sugar Shea is in the Zoom meeting. And they're going to be delivering some pretty sweet DJ sets straight to your home. So be sure to stretch out because we're dancing tonight. But that's about it, folks. Good night. See you later. Thanks, everyone. Bye.